Okay guys, welcome back to the Lightburn for Gantry Crash Course. In the last video, we left off with setting up Lightburn and adding our machine itself to Lightburn. Here, in episode 2 of the Crash Course, what we'll be doing now is going through and discussing some of the primary settings and workspace options to make your workspace, well, yours. Where we're going to be spending most of our time today is actually up here at the top under general lightburn settings. Now these are the settings for lightburn itself and a lot of it influences the way you work with your workspace and how you interact with your UI. This can sometimes get confused with the device settings which is right next to it but this is more tailored toward the device you're working with itself and how the software interacts with the device. This will be for a video another day. Today we're focusing on settings for Lightburn. There may be some options here that over time depending on the projects you might be working on you may want to change or may just be situational. You'll find that some settings you like and you don't like and you can fine tune those over time. We're going to start by talking about filled rendering and the reason why I do that is because most of you will find this very helpful. This is the first setting that I enable when first installing Lightburn on a new computer, or reinstalling it. This is not on by default, at least as of this update, but for me, it's a must-have. It really helps with my workflow and being able to quickly identify what is a cut line and what is a filled object. With this off, everything will visually look like a line, even if it's set as a fill. I'll show you an example here. I'm going to turn off filled rendering, and we're going to return to our workspace. And I'm going to make two boxes, one on the left, one on the right. Now you can see here that I have orange as line and black as fill. What we're going to do is return to our settings, and we're going to enable filled rendering. And now you can see at a glance why I like this option. You can see exactly what's being filled and exactly what is a cut line this allows you to, at a glance, see exactly what's being filled without having to review every single cut and layer. As you can see, there can be many of them. This really, for me, helps reduce the chances of an oopsie or an oversight on a project. Now the next most common question is, where's dark mode? Where's dark mode? Where's dark mode? Now for some of you, this doesn't matter so much. But, for those of you it does matter for, they do have a dark mode, but it's only a dark background for the work area. I'll show you what that looks like here. Now, this isn't what I'm sure most of you are expecting, but this is what we have to work with on dark mode for Lightburn at the moment. I do hope they implement a true dark mode for the whole software theme. At this time, that's not something they have. Moving on to beginner mode. Now, this is the first setting on the very top, and you'll notice the tooltip on it says, hide some of the more advanced settings. It can be turned off and on at any point, and right now, by default, it is off. However, turning it on basically just hides some of the additional settings on the top here and on the left side. If we go ahead and do that, a lot of what goes missing when you enable beginner mode is a lot of the alignment shortcuts. Now, for some people, when they're getting started with a new piece of software, having additional buttons that might not be needed when getting used to the software can be distracting and you end up having to fish through and look at additional buttons repeatedly over and over. Understandably, this is a good spot where beginner mode makes sense. For those of us who find that having additional buttons there don't really come as a distraction, having it on or off isn't going to make much of a difference for those people. For me personally, I leave it on and work around them, and once I started getting more used to the software, they were a welcome addition to my workflow, and I do use them from time to time. So I do leave beginner mode off. That said, this is about what you like and you're creating your workspace. So do what makes you feel more comfortable. You can always turn it off or on in the future just by going back to the Lightburn settings. Another recommendation that I'll make is turning up curve quality can help out and improve the user experience. For me, I leave it on high, but if you have a really sharp eye, maybe turning that up to perfect isn't such a bad idea. You may find that it might make Lightburn work just a little bit harder, and if that's weighing on your system, you can simply turn that back down to high or lower if you feel the need or desire to. There isn't too much in the way of functionality that you gain or lose from curve quality at this point. An additional setting that might be useful to know from person to person or preference to preference is the inverse mouse wheel. Inverting your mouse wheel zoom direction is going to affect, in the reverse, what this does in software for you. Now that is entirely a preference thing, and there's no right or wrong answer on that. I suggest trying it out, and if you find that you like it one way versus the other, use that option. Now you can adjust your toolbar icon size to fit your needs. 
as well as your font size. I also want to bring up the ignore out of bounds shapes if possible setting here on the bottom left of the display and graphics area. Now this setting will allow you to shift an object out of the engrave area in case you have multiple files or designs in one file that you want to swap between for example. Or if you're testing or trying different things on different objects, you can move the ones that you're not currently working on or testing out of the engrave area. It's not going to send the data for this object, for example, to your laser. Now we're going to be moving down into the grids and units area. Now here you can pick what measurement units you wish to use for both measuring sizes as well as the units of speed. I've grown a preference to using millimeters for everything, but while getting used to using millimeters for everything, I used inches for sizing and millimeters a second for speed for my CO2. However, for my diode, I did use millimeters minute because it is a much slower machine. Overall, any parameters we generally share and most people within the community and industry will usually refer to speed settings in the millimeters per second for CO2 and for fiber, whereas diode being much slower can often be referred to as millimeters per minute. If you're getting started with both machines, that will be something you'll want to be aware of when bouncing between them. 500 millimeters per minute on a diode may be realistic, but 500 millimeters per minute on a CO2 laser might be the start of an unplanned bonfire. That said, don't leave these machines running alone or unchecked. Additionally, you can resize the grid spacing, especially if you want something specific to help you in designing or moving things around. I like the default of 10 millimeters spacing personally, but there are some who prefer smaller or larger, and there's no harm in changing that. Grid contrast does exactly what it sounds like. It adjusts the contrast value of the grid in the background. Now functionally, this isn't going to affect the software in terms of your projects. However, it can affect how comfortable you are personally using the software. So I recommend you find a setting that you like. Now within the same settings for grid, we're also going to be talking about snap distance. Now what that is, is in my case, you'll find that every one millimeter my item wants to snap. Now that means as I drag my mouse across here, you're going to see it jump 10 times because it's a 10 millimeter block. Now for most use cases, that will be perfectly fine. However, for some people, they prefer having a different snap distance or no snap distance. It's perfectly okay to turn snap off, either from grid or other objects, or you can simply adjust the snap distance, bigger or smaller, depending on what suits your needs. Adjusting it larger will increase the distance in which it will snap. So instead of one snap distance, you can set it to two, and instead of one millimeter jumps, it will make two millimeter jumps. Now that we're done talking about the units and grid section as well as snapping, we're gonna jump down to shape move increments. If you like utilizing your arrow keys to shift objects, you're in luck. You can set the distance in which you want the items to jump or move when you tap the arrow keys. Adding modifiers like the control and arrow key or shift and arrow key will let you set a second and third preference for the jump distance. You can even combine the two using shift and control to get even more fine adjustment. In my case, these are the defaults where control plus arrow gives me a one millimeter jump, just the arrow key gives me a five millimeter jump, and shift plus arrow gives me a 20 millimeter jump. If I use just the arrow key, you can see a five millimeter jump. However, if I use the control key, it's a one millimeter jump. If I hold the shift key, it's a 20 millimeter jump. Holding shift and control with an arrow key gives you fractions of a millimeter in movement. Very fine control. Now for the purposes of the basics and getting started, we're not gonna be reviewing the camera capture system at this time. We're gonna be moving on to file settings. Now we aren't going to dig into these too deep, but most of these are related to how imported items behave or get imported into Lightburn. I leave these at the default, but depending on your preference and your workflow, you may want to adjust them. For example, you may want imported shapes to be grouped on import. Or if you're working with AI files, you may want to import hidden layers from your AI files. Or you may want to be able to import directly to a tool layer. Or as you import a new shape or object, it's highlighted for you to move or adjust. Now moving on from that, there are additional default settings for font, DXF import setting, and of course other default states of options for Lightburn. And again, I opt to leave these as default for myself, but I encourage you to make the software as convenient for you 
as possible. So pick any changes that best suit your needs. And you can always change them back later if you find they aren't meeting your needs or you don't like them. Now that wraps up the second episode of the Lightburn for Gantry Crash Course and covered most of the customizable settings that influence how you interface with the software and your workspace. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Lightburn for Gantry Crash Course. If you got value out of this episode, smash the like button, let everybody know the content's great. Subscribe if you haven't yet, and if you're interested in seeing future episodes of the Crash Course or other fun content, hit that bell icon so you get notified as soon as it goes live. If you want to join the LA community or just hang out and chat, there's links to the Discord and Facebook group down below. You'll also find a link to the Laser Master Academy, whose members I'd like to thank for making this all possible. We love learning and sharing with you all, and we couldn't be here in this capacity without such an amazing community. We hope to see you over in one of our communities, and I hope you enjoy the next episode of the Lightburn for Gantry Crash Course.